I first heard about Burning Man in when was Obama elected? Two thousand eight. Right. So oh eight, I was in. It was my yeah, because it was my but about to be my birthday. So my birthday's White Paper Day, Halloween, thirty first yeah. of October, and obviously my ex at the time. We were we'd done a little trip. We'd gone. We'd flown to L.A., driven up to San Francisco, gone through Yosemite, Vegas. And followed the border and finished in, we finished in LA, but we went to, fuck, no, the place south of uh, here. San Diego? San Diego. Why can't I remember that? San Diego. We finished San Diego. But when we were in San Diego, we were there the night that Obama got elected. We went to this bar. It's like, um, uh, like a craft brewery place. We're like, this is cool. So we just drunk beer watching the election come in. Two Actually, a weird thing happened that night. We were watching the TV, watched the election come come in, and then interviewing people on the TV. And my um, ex wife was like, "That's your head <laughs> <laughs> on the TV." And we looked, and there was a camera outside interviewing someone. It came through. Yeah. But like, I met a guy there who's telling me about Burning Man. Then two thousand eight, he's like, "Yeah, you've got to go. Um, it's where everyone who works in Silicon Valley goes to escape." Uh, yeah, I, I think it like like it deserves that. It deserves a reputation insofar as like you have a whole bunch of like like annoying tech bros who go there. But there's like a real like authentic underbelly to Burning Man, like the artists and the creativity and how much work these people spend an entire year creating these art installations and these exhibits and these like, um, like experiential, like, you know, like experiential installations. And like, it's really incredible, like how much blood, sweat and tears people go into like actually doing it. So I've been kind of really defensive of Burning Man, like since having been there and been like, guys, like there's like a real bunch of like credit that like the, of, of to human creativity that's not getting its due because everyone's just focusing on the fact that a bunch of rich tech bros go there every year. And like, that's true and that's annoying. It's like kind of the same thing here in like LA. Like I think LA is like a very actually like culturally diverse city, like with like lots of really authentic neighborhoods, but everyone can just focus on like the uh, Rodeo Drive in Beverly Hills and how fake it seems, right? And I think I think Burning Man's kind of like the same way. Like there's there is like truth to the fact that like yes, there's like a shallow sort of like egocentric LA, and and you can find people like that. I run into them every day. But then there's like other real people who are just like normal fucking people, right? That are um, that are making the city a better place. They're opening small businesses. And Burning Man is kind of like that. And I think I think in the same way that LA gets a bad rap for being like a phony, like skin deep place, which I don't think is true. Like I think there's many different parts of the city that have really, really deep culture. And, and Burning Man is the same way. There's like a deep culture there of like people who are like like truly into it and truly like think to themselves, like, how am I going to create like the most magical experience next year? I'm like, how am I going to like build the, this insane art piece that's, that people are going to see and it's going to blow their fucking mind, right? Like, and those people just get kind of swept aside in this sort of anti-Burning Man like narrative that everyone has because of all the rich tech bros. I still want to go. I want to see it for myself. <laughs> I want to get dressed up like I'm in Mad Max. You come to my camp. I'll, I'll, I'll set you up. I'll come in your camp. All right. So this is when is when is it? It's a year from now now, basically, because it was, it was eleven months from now. Hold on, I don't even know where, where, where. It's the end of August. It's the end of August. It's the end of August. Okay. Right. No, I'm in. I'm All done. Right, let's do it. I'm coming. <laughs> I want to experience it, but I want to go with a. What do they call you? Burners or something? Yeah, I'm a burner now. I want to go with a burner. <laughs> I want to experience it. I want to bump into. Uh, I don't know. Who did you bump into? Like Mark Zuckerberg? And... Uh, so uh, the only person I bumped into of any note was uh, Sergey Brin <laughs> from Google. He showed up at our camp um, to visit someone um, who he knew at my camp, um, who was like a, some like rich VC that I didn't, I don't really know actually. So that was that was my. I'm in. Right, I'm in. So <laughs> get me a t- get me a ticket. Tell me when to send the Bitcoin. I'll let you know. Oh yeah, I'll text you. I'll text you the deets. Uh, but I also love LA. I mean, it's great to come. I mean, we were just saying, we, every time I come back, I just forget how much I love it here. I think it's a brilliant city with loads of issues. I'm a big defender of LA. Yeah, I love it. Um, and I think that, I think it's, so what I tell people is like, why do you love LA? Like, why do you like LA better than New York? And I love New York too. I'm not one of these people who's like LA rules, LA, New York sucks or vice versa. I think LA is great because it doesn't take itself too seriously. 
And what I mean by that is when you go to a place like San Francisco or you go to a place like New York, people have this really strong inbuilt conception of like what New York is or what San Francisco is and what it should be. And I think that's at the nexus of a lot of the things that are wrong in a place like San Francisco because people are really obsessed with this conception of like the authentic San Francisco. And that's why you, and that's used to justify nimbyism, not building housing, which leads to the, the housing crisis that exists there. Whereas you look at a place like LA, we've been relatively more successful at pursuing things like upzoning strategies to increase the housing supply here. It's not enough, right? Like we should be doing a lot more, but because the city doesn't really have this sort of inbuilt conception of like, this is what LA looks like. This is what LA feels like. This is what LA culture is. And, and those are things that San Franciscans or New Yorkers have really, really strong conceptions of. And I think that's very limiting. Whereas here, it's just sort of like just pure creativity. Everyone's just like making shit up. And there's like something invigorating about that. Mm. Like being, and, and this is the cultural capital of the world. Like like literally like the entertainment industry, the music industry, um, even, even like even like most influencers of Node on Instagram and TikTok are like, they, they live here. Like this is, this is where people come um, to, to be on the world stage. And that's, that's, there's something exciting about that. And I think LA gets a, gets a really bad rap. I love it. Well, I think it's more than that to me, though. Uh, the geography is brilliant because you can be in Venice. You can be all Santa Monica by the beach. You can go up to Topanga, go up to the canyon, go hiking. I love canyon country. In yeah. LA. It's amazing. Um, if you, you're what, an hour and a half from San Diego, uh, then just a little bit further from Mexico. Um, but you can go up to wine country if you want. You can you can cut east and you can go across to um, Yosemite. There's There's a lot in a small area that's quite diverse in terms of geography, then uh, I prefer, it's weird, because I also like um, Texas, mm -hmm. and I really like Nashville, uh, but I, I like the progressive side here as well. I, mm -hmm. I like to have the mix. Um, the music scene's brilliant, there's art everywhere. You, you, you see it visually everywhere. I, mm -hmm. I love LA, I mean. L LA is, like, it's, it's still a very, like, obviously a very liberal leaning city, but like relatively speaking, it's more politically diverse than San Francisco or New mm. York, like in like relatively speaking. Um, and, and you can definitely feel that. And so I, I definitely think that, um, like I said, like I, I, LA, I, LA is not Hollywood. Mm. Like in Hollywood is not LA. I mean, Hollywood sort of like rep, like is the kind of the biggest representative, uh, thing in the media that that sort of portrays LA, but LA's not that. You don't see it really when you're here unless you choose to go and see it. Exactly, exactly. Have you seen a big degradation over the last like five plus years? Here in LA? Yeah. I think, well, I, I think LA has actually like bounced back, like mostly um, from the pre-pandemic pre era. Like it feels mostly the same as it was before. I think I definitely have noticed the effects of the the writer's strike um, here. Interesting. Um, you can kind of see that and businesses are complaining a little bit. Cause like, this, this is this is the other side of LA because like most, the biggest industry is the entertainment industry. Huge percentage of that is gig work. Mm -hmm. So people are not, they're not on salaries. They're going from project to project. They're getting, they're joining a gig to work on a TV show for a season or to shoot a commercial or to, to shoot a movie. And so those people kind of re rely on sort of a constant rotation of that work coming in. And so we've had a five month writer's strike and that has essentially led, left a large portion of the working population here, like unemployed. And, and, and we, you, you can, there's definitely a lot of discussion. Restaurants have seen a decrease in reservations and because people are clearly saving their money, right? Like they're having to work on strike pay, right? And so um, now that that looks like the writer's strike is over, I mean, I think hopefully it will get back to normal. Going to keep the robots out of the films. <laughs> yes. Yeah, we're going to keep the AI out of the films. <laughs> yeah. Wow. Anyway, Mike, always good to see you. <laughs> always good to see you. The anti-contrarian. The anti-contrarian. Someone described you that as you today. I'm not going to tell you who till afterwards. Oh, I want to know who that is. Yeah. You want to tell me? Uh, Stephen Lubka. He call, oh, he called me the anti-contrarian? Not that, as a not as an like, insult. It's interesting because someone was trying to argue with me the other day that I am a contrarian. Um, You're a contrarian contrarian. I, I don't even, like, I, I don't even know what that 
really means, right? Like, I think. Um, Let me frame it better. <laughs> I think all of us in Bitcoin are contrarians. Yeah. And there's different groups. Mm -hmm. There are perhaps right contrarians, left contrarians, libertarian contrarians. Mm -hmm. uh, and look, you and I talk a lot. You yeah. Know, we message each other because. I think we share similar skepticism to the worldviews that some Bitcoiners have, mm -hmm. and these things should be discussed. Do you know what I'm contrarian about? Oh, the, yeah. like, let me like like the thing that I think really bothers me, and this has always sort of been an aspect of my personality going all the way back to like when I can kind of even remember having an intellectual life, which is probably, you know, the last few years of of, of high school when I kind of first started really forming what I would count as like a worldview, right? And, and obviously my politics and my worldview have shifted dramatically since that time. But one thing I've always felt really uncomfortable about, and this has kind of been a through line in my life, no matter what what kind of policy choices or, or, or what I believed about uh, the trajectory of the world, was I really don't like when everyone's agreeing. Yeah. I really don't like that. I mean, there've been so many times where like I, like I get really bored. Like I'll be at a I'll be at a dinner with like a bunch of friends, and we're all just like agreeing about some political issue, and I kind of like feel that tension of like maybe I should represent the other side of this argument. Like maybe I should like dig in a little bit and try to steel man, like or or at least add some nuance at the very least. I'm I'm very uncomfortable with this idea of certainty. I and and I've changed my mind a lot. I'm, you know, I have like a pretty deep background in in epistemology, uh, which is like the, the study of like what, what can be known, um, to know that like we're really fallible, right? Like we walk around, I walk around the world, I have a very, very narrow view onto the universe. Um, like I can only see what I see like directly in front of me right now. I've only read what I've read. I've only seen what I've seen. I only have the memories that I have. There is like the vast, vast majority of available information in the world is not in my brain, right? And so like what I'm really doing is prioritizing what to pay attention to. That's like ultimately like what I'm doing. And so the real skill about being, I think, an intelligent person who can make reasonably good predictions about the future of the things to avoid, the things to double down on, um, you know, to things to question, I mean, is really just about managing your attention and being really smart about that, right? Like, um, you know, we, we live in a world now where like we're always connected. I can go on Wikipedia. We have ChatGPT right now, like to, you know, to try and like augment ourselves. And, um, and, I, and I think those tools are interesting. Like I spend probably way too much time arguing with ChatGPT because it's like, I love to argue and it's like, there's always someone there willing to argue with me and it's in, 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 the, in, the, in the form of an AI. No, it's great because like, um, like I'll, 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 I'll start a chat GPT conversation and I'll, I'll prompt it at the very beginning and I'll say, I want you, I'm going to like start. Hold on, can we do this? Yeah. Oh. Let's do a live argument. Because <laughs> I had an argument with, um, who, what is um, uh, Google's? Bard. Bard, right? Yeah. It told me something. I was like, no, you're wrong. It said, oh, I'm really sorry. <laughs> I was like, did you do that on purpose? And they said, yes. <laughs> right, go on. Let's, uh, let's have an argument. I've only got GPT-3. Well, so like, what I would cheap. typically do is I would tell ChatGPT, like, I'm going to like start an argument. I'm going to make an argument to you, and I want you to argue the opposite to me, just like reflexively. And then I will just sort of continue to have these arguments. And I think that's like really interesting because, and actually there's been so many times where it's pointed out that there's some book that was written or there was some philosopher or there's some political scientist who had like a really good counter argument to that. And I was like, and, and actually there was a few times where it like, it sent me down a rabbit hole being like, wait a second, my argument isn't that strong. Um, and, so and this and so, is a great tool for sharpening yeah. your tools. Yeah, it's a really great job. I, uh, I mean, I, I, I love it. I love this. Okay, well, should um, we have a, let's do a Bitcoin one. Let's do a Bitcoin one. Uh, I, I, okay, my argument is, sorry, I'm going to hijack. <laughs> my <laughs> argument is that Bitcoin is the best money in the world and will fix all the world's problems. Then we'll do one of your probably more intellectual. No, this is great. Fun. Actually, I like this one. 
Like, I, I, actually, I think we should, this is, I All like right. that you asked this because I think we should talk about some of these things. So, you know, you get like, you know, it mentions the volatility, the price volatility, like uh, like relative to people's like, uh, you know, the, the like the, 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 the currency that they that they use in their daily bait like in their daily life um that's like a real problem a scalability challenges we all know about that we can talk about lightning but like well this is interesting. these are all real like these are all real things that, so uh, let me so just, argument. just for people listening so it's come back and said bitcoin is not the best money in the world and it cannot fix all the world's problems while it's gained popularity it has some unique fixtures and so it does the typical ones volatility well we can make future yeah. arguments scalability we can make arguments about second layers Regulatory challenges, we can talk about how that's a shift in environment. Environmental concerns, we can say, well, you know, there's counter arguments to that. Lack of privacy again. But I think the most interesting one's that last one. Yeah. Number seven. Yeah, number e seven. That's great. Economic uh, and social problem. Bitcoin alone cannot solve complex global issues like poverty, inequality, and geopolitical conflicts. These problems are deeply rooted and require multifaceted solutions beyond the scope of any single currency. Do you know why this is interesting? It's very, why? To me. Why okay. is that interesting? So, so I've just been out to Lebanon and very quickly, you know, you spend a week there, you realize Bitcoin can't fix this because Bitcoin is like an individual solution to you to the things you want it to solve. For me, it solves long-term savings and some transfers of money and and it's a moonshot to a better life. It's like yeah. it's a, but. And so when you look at the problems of Lebanon where they've got no effective government and the money's collapsed and everyone's moved to the dollar, to fix Lebanon, you need more than a better currency, okay? Firstly, you actually need dollars, yeah. okay? Uh, you you need um, security put in place because they don't have effective security. Yeah. There's all these things that it needs and Bitcoin is one of those things. But to say Bitcoin fixes Lebanon, I think is an arrogant and misinformed statement from somebody who hasn't really spent any time probably outside of their hometown. And and also, I mean, this this gets at like probably, I, I think I think this is number seven too. And, and what you just said is like the nature, I think, of what my message has been in the Bitcoin community this whole time, right? Which is I'm working on Bitcoin. Like I've, like, you know, I, I've, decided to make it my full-time job because I see like the potential to improve the world. But I, you know, to, to use a philosophical term, like I take like a, a, an instrumentalist view of Bitcoin in the same way that I take an instrumentalist view of smartphone technology or an instrumentalist view of the internet, which is to say that like, it is a tool that I can use to affect real change towards a more positive future. But that is, it is one component of what the broad tapestry of complex modern civilization is made up of, right? Um, one of the things that I, I try really, really hard to uh, get people to think about is the fact that, um, well, one, like just to back up one a little bit here, like the, the one sentiment that re really annoyed me, like, earlier this year that I saw that was like very like, like, and you, and you saw this as well, which was like the, the kind of the attitude that Bitcoin has already won. There was this kind of, there's this kind of moment in time, if you remember when uh, Silicon Valley Bank collapsed, uh, you know, Signature Bank collapsed, and there was kind of this like attitude in the, in the Bitcoin community. It's like, well, this is it guys, like this is it, like US dollar is gonna be done by the end of this year. So everyone better get into Bitcoin. And, and I was, maybe like one of the few Bitcoiners that was like tweeting and quote tweeting people and saying, no, this is like crazy. Like, no, like that's obviously not going to happen. Like you need to think about the entire incentive structure around the US dollar. And of course the US, the, 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 the Federal Reserve and the government and businesses and banks and even US trading partners are gonna close ranks to try and stabilize the situation. I think there's one more thing you can add into that. It's like, like I don't think you want it to win at this point unless you're a greedy psychopath. Well, may, may, maybe, like I, I'm trying to leave the normative aside for a second, <laughs> we can get to that. But like the, the, like what I think I try to do as before you kind of like, I mean, there's, there's two ways you can like approach these things. You can, uh, construct a narrative in your head of like what you want the world to be. And then you can rationalize like, what are the things I need to change about the world to adjust reality to that narrative? I think that's a 
dead end way of trying to change the world. I think it's it's terrible. It's how you get ideologues. It's how you get closed minded people. Um, it, it's it's how you create like echo chambers. Um, and I think the way that you really move the world forward is by first taking stock of how the world really is and like what is really going on. And the biggest mistake I think a lot of Bitcoiners make, quite frankly, is they overprivilege the role of money in society. Not that money isn't an important part of society. Like who would say that? Obviously it's a very important part of society. Like, you know, it, it like, it, it informs everything we do. Like uh, they're like the economy, our modern economy would not function without money, right? We'd be back at barter. Like there's no doubt that it's it's significant and a prodigious part of the superstructure that makes up the complexity of the world. But like, so are a lot of other things, right? Like, so is just like raw culture. So is is technology itself. Um, and, and some philosophers might argue that technology and culture aren't really different things, really. Like Mar Mar Marshall McLuhan, like being an example, a famous example of that, um, which I'm sympathetic to. I'm sympathetic to that argument. Um, and I obviously the, the political economy uh, of the way in which states are organized and the connections between industry and government, the, 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 thing, the economic incentives that governments create and the economic disincentives governments create, sometimes intentionally, sometimes unintentionally. These are really, really important factors to understand like how the world is. I'll give you another example of, of you know, one of the things that was completely not unexpected to me. Like I started tweeting two or three years ago about how I really thought that like that that China was in a lot of trouble, like economically. And I and I have sort of poo-pooed this idea that they're gonna eclipse the United States, that they're gonna create a sinocentric world order, um, that the yuan is going to overtake the US dollar as a global reserve currency, that there's gonna be petro yuans instead of petro dollars. And this was like all almost like very like why like everyone was sort of at a in a state of like, well, of course that's going to happen. Like and and my my view on this was is that like first of all you you might you can construct a case that that's the future of the world if you simple if you rely on very narrow economic assumptions but you can't just rely on narrow, narrow economic assumptions because people don't simply act on narrow economic assumptions there's this 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 uh, concept or well, this I, well, this idiom idiomatic thing in, in in economics where called you know homo economictus which is this idea that you that in order to understand the 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 world and uh, economics you treat every human being as like a rational economic actor and that uh, i .e., you know, homo economictus and that each person will make rational economic choices and those rational economic choices are all about like, you know, the maximization of economic value, you know, and like obviously like people come together and they form economies and there's price discovery and that leads to efficient, uh, you know, investments. And this is like kind of the basis for the efficient market hypothesis that Ludwig von Mises is famous for framing. And I think it's, that's a completely like bullshit conception of like how the world works. Like humans act against their economic interests all the time. They're they're lazy. They could like put in a few more hours, right? Like, you know, and, and make some overtime or they could, um, you know, they could go and get a harder job. I mean, there's a lot of people out there that are just completely happy. I mean, I meet them all the time. They're like, hey, like, you're like, no, I'm completely happy. I took a pay cut, but I'm, I'm working the job of my life. Or, or uh, you know, people, there were farmers in during uh, the the years that Trump was president that were being hit really really hard by the the tariffs that that um, that Trump had put on China or, or sorry the, counter, the countervailing tariffs that China had put on in response to the U.S. tariffs that targeted U.S. soybeans and corn and rice and a lot of these farmers were like I don't care that I'm losing all this business because. Like, I believe that the president is doing this thing to like protect the, the, the good of the country. And so like this, this idea that I think a lot of Bitcoiners have that economic incentives are sort of at the center of what will predict the future of the world is just completely wrong. And I predicted that China was up against a real problem for very, one very simple reason. Nobody, nobody trusts Beijing and the Chinese Communist Party around the world. Not even their, not even their so-called friends. Like I don't even think Putin trusts Xi Jinping completely to the point that like Putin would put 
the entire fate of Russia in the hands of of Beijing, and that and there and, and there just isn't there just isn't a world where like China is going to be able to advance itself in that way, and that's 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 I think the way you need to look at the world, you need to take a step back and consider there's all these different incentives that are going on. And I think a lot of Bitcoiners, they 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 do the homo economictus thing and it causes them to have a very distorted perception of how the world is. And it causes them to make a whole bunch of predictions of the things that they think are inevitably going to happen, which are almost certainly not going to happen because they're not factoring in other really important things. That's, that's like kind of like my big point that I would make. Well, it was interesting because we just did an interview with um, George Gammon and Jeff Booth. I'm a big fan of Jeff Booth. Yeah. Love his book. Yeah, I love everything he talks about in terms of ideas about deflation. You know, I, I just think he's a very smart guy. George we should came, talk about that, the inflation versus deflation debate. It's yeah. really interesting as well. But but George came on and and I think what it is is I think the different points of view they were coming from is George had a lot of questions about Bitcoin and its role. But he was really challenging Bitcoin in terms of the current structure of the global economy mm -hmm. or even you know local economies. You know, thinking about how credit works, debt works, yeah, you know, and Bitcoin's role within that and the restrictions you get from Bitcoin, the design of the technology. Whereas Jeff was coming from a point of view saying, that's not how you should be thinking. You should be thinking of a complete redesign of the system because of Bitcoin. And I actually thought George made some very good arguments, had some good questions. When you go into the comment section on YouTube, and the majority of the people in there saying, George is an idiot. Is you know he he can't think outside of the box. You know George doesn't get Bitcoin. You know what's his issue? Like there were so many comments, and there was the other one going. Actually, I think George asked some good questions, and I think the I think the only fair point, position to take was they both make interesting points. Mm -hmm. They both have interesting questions. We have no idea whether Bitcoin is going to reshape the entire global economy and global markets, or whether it's going to be a tool that sits within it. None of us know, mm -hmm. but it's really good that people are asking these questions so we can debate it. I think we can make. I think we can make some pretty good educated guesses. Yeah, about, yeah you can about, make some about about how Bitcoin is going to involve itself in in the global economy. But that's the difference. Yeah. That's the difference between an educated guess and a position of certainty. Because mm -hmm. I think the problem with the position of certainty, there's two issues. There's probably multiple issues, but two issues I have with absolute certainty is that you. You're probably going to get disappointed, but when certainty exists, that's where you get the groupthink. Because mm -hmm. if the right person acts with certainty, there are certain people who've written books in the world of Bitcoin. They say things with such certainty, they're like um, they're like the Pied Piper. As soon as they start saying like mm -hmm. I don't know, dogs are a scam, everyone's like, yeah, dogs are a scam. Mm -hmm. You know, and and, and the ch I think in some ways that becomes a problem because it makes us all look like fucking idiots. Mm -hmm. We have, I'm going on multiple sub, uh, topics here, but you know, we have a branding issue with Bitcoin. Mm -hmm. uh, I talk to my friends, they're like, yeah, I see your Twitter, Pete, you're all fucking psychos, you're crazy. Mm -hmm. yeah. And we need to get away from that crazy talk and have a better way of explaining our ideas. No, I, I agree. And um, this is my frustration too. I mean, I go into a lot of rooms with, you know, a lot of you know, uh, well-heeled people who are quite interested in Bitcoin and and like they they see like potential there, and it and people often will prompt me and say, you know, when I look into it and I Google it and I go on to some of these like Bitcoin publications or I go on Twitter and I see what like people are talking about and it just seems absolutely crazy to me the things these people are saying and then I recoil and then I'm like I don't want anything to do with this. I mean, that has been something that has come up a few times. And I think that, um, well, one, I, you know, I'm, I'm, Jeff Booth and I have argued about this a few times when we've been in the same place. And we had like a, down in Costa Rica, I think we had like a two and a half hour debate with each other um, Daddy, where were on, we this, <laughs> on this inflation deflation um, conversation. We could have done whatever some mics are. Yeah, no, that would have been great. Uh, no, I, you know, you, I'll tell uh, one thing actually. Um, so Jeff and I don't like completely agree on, on this point, but what I will say about Jeff is I think, uh, and I, and I think, I know I'm presuming here, but I, I think he would say the same thing about me is that like, he's actually one of the more uh, intellectually honest people that I've had disagreements with mm. because he will debate in good faith and he'll make a good faith like attempt to sort of understand what I'm saying and respond to it and and like admit 
like when he doesn't have a good answer to something. Jeff's great. I would like he's just this really productive guy to have a conversation with. Um, and so I, I really love Jeff. Um, I hope the feeling's mutual. Um, but I, I do disagree with him on, on a few things, right? Like, um, you know, and everyone should go read the, the Price of Tomorrow because it's a, um, like, it's a really, really well presented case for like the, the general argument that a lot of the productive gains from, from, technolo from, from technological breakthroughs, you know, over the last 40, 50 years have, have not necessarily been distributed as they might otherwise have been given a stable money supply. I think I'm, if I'm, if I'm kind of summarizing his sort of core hypothesis accurately. Um, and I'm, I'm not, I, and, 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 and I think Jeff knows my position on this too, is like, I'm not a hundred percent sure that like I'm, I'm fully bought into, to, to why that's true. Right. Because, um, and I'm, or at least I'm not sure that we would have had the same level of economic growth if we had had a stable or de, or a stable or decreasing money supply. Um, and the reason why I think that's true is that I think there's a, and this is a common fallacy and it's founded neoclassical economic thinking these days as well as classical economic thinking, particularly focused around like the Austrian school, which is this idea that, um, that there's an ideal equilibria of the of like of like money like money supply like like fixed money supply as like a sort of a perfect proxy for economic activity in particular in, in particular like the degree of of money which is saved is reflects is reflective somehow of the productive capacity of the of of the economy um to um sustain sort of like investment and risk taking. Another way of putting that is like, if you think about, you know, um, imagine a hyper Bitcoinized world with, you know, everyone's using Bitcoin for everything. And so we have 21 million Bitcoin, we're limited to that. And let's say 30% of that is saved, right? Um, so there's gonna be a market for accessing those savings for uh, lending, like, like, like people want to borrow money, factories want to borrow money so they can retool their, their factories and make them more efficient. Some, uh, some, uh, companies want to, uh, undertake research and development or take risks on new, new technologies. Um, venture capital largely plays that role in our economy. Um, and like, so the cost of money is really, really important to risk-taking in our economy. So in the hyper Bitcoinized world, and this is kind of why I, this kind of, this is kind of the core of my thesis as to like why I'm not fully bought into the idea that hyper Bitcoinization is ever in the cards. And I'll get to why I think Bitcoin is still a very important part of the future of money, um, even after I almost sound like I'm making an argument against it. But if you imagine a world where money, like sitting on money, is going to return to you three, four, five percent a year of uh, of, of increased purchasing power. Um, what that means, and economists might then say that that represents like a three to five percent risk-free rate, right? So, so if you're going to go and borrow money now, the the cost of borrowing money is going to be the risk-free rate plus um, whatever like the cost of servicing that debt is, plus the cost of the amortized or uh, fully distributed loss rate of that is. Um, and then, so you're gonna get up into a world where you're never going to see a world where you have anything short of like eight, nine, 10% interest rates on debt in a hyper Bitcoinized world. It's just going to be very, very expensive debt. Some honest people on the other side of this debate, and, and I've noted that that, that Beautyon um, has been one of the few few uh, honest Austrians about this. And he has conceded that, that's, that this would lead to an economy of thrift, that, that he kind of concedes the point that I'm making. And he, and he will argue that's a good thing, that we'll, we'll tend to um, spend our money on things that last longer. We will be more discerning with our purchases. We won't be a consumerist culture anymore. That's actually kind of an honest sort of like, like understanding of what one of the consequences of being on a on a fixed supply commodity money would have for the world. It would it will push the cost of taking risks much much higher. Now, so where this comes kind of comes back to my my slight disagreement with 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 Jeff is it's not clear to me that government 
um, you know, incentivizing lower borrowing rates um, has not led to greater risk. Like, I don't know that, that do we get Apple and Microsoft and, and, and Google and all these, these, these massive companies that kind of spawned in the same era that we, that we often talk about, you know, there's the, this obviously all fits in the era inside underneath the graphs of WTF happened in 1971. Like, is, was there an increase of risk taking that wouldn't have otherwise happened under a more constrained money supply because interest rates would have been much higher. Therefore, like investors seeking, uh, like would be less likely to take higher risks when they can get 5% returns, just basically stuffing their Bitcoin in their, under their proverbial mattress. And I think that's like the other side, I think this is the other side to the debate around deflationary currency. Um, and I think you really that, I, I, and I think that, so this is why I think beauty on, you know, and I obviously don't agree with him on Austrian economics, but I at least agree with him that he has at least, um, uh, he has at least like correctly inferred the implications of what he's saying. Um, and, and I would argue if that's true, then that is just going to mean like degrowth basically. Like, and, 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 I, and, I, and I think that that is probably not the world we want to live in. Yeah, so, I mean, I think you're asking the right questions and they're fair questions. I mean, I've asked it before, is more trying to understand uh, other benefits. Have we had a faster growing economy, therefore lifted more people out of poverty, had better advancements in medicine and medicine tech? You know, do we get the radiology machines we have or the MRI machines because of this? Have we had more innovation because of that? And we, we, we can talk about absolute living standards too yeah. and, the, and the material. Like, and so I, so I, I, do have, I do have some disagreements with the whole WTF happened in 1971 graphs. I do think there is a major, major missed, um, there is a very mi major missed interpretation of that data. Um, first of all, like um, when we look across the last 30 to 40 years, there's this narrative that the middle class and particularly the lowest quintile has been falling behind precipitously since the end of Bretton Woods in 1971. Um, now, when you look at notional price data, and, um, that appears to be true, right? Like, and 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 I think that that's why those graphs are so startling and 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 cause like such this intense like moral reaction. The problem is, though, a lot of those graphs are not actually inflation adjusted. They're not adjusted for um, the average industrial wage across time. They're not adjusted for. Um, like a whole bunch of things. So like one of the interesting things that I think people should do when they're, they're trying, if, if you're trying to ask yourself the question, is the working class, the middle class, like are they advancing or are they sitting still or are they declining? Price levels are a really bad way to figure that out because um, uh, first of all, like you have, you there's just, there's all these concerns. There's like these hedonic concerns that you have to sort of sort through in order to like sort of figure out what's really going on. Like you have to know what people want first before you can judge whether or not they're getting it, right? This is sort of the where hedonic weighting comes in in economics. And there isn't, there isn't like this kind of comes back to the homo economictus thing, right? Like, so if I am this, if, if the average person wants to eat a lot of macaroni and cheese, right? Then whether or not someone can afford a lot of macaroni and cheese is a really important economic indicator, right? If people don't, if no, almost nobody eats macaroni and cheese, you probably really shouldn't care that much at a policy level what macaroni and cheese costs, right? This is, this is what hedonic weighting is. It's, it's, it's why when we measure inflation, we do consumer survey data, we go out there to figure out what are the basket of goods that consumers are telling us that they want to buy. And then we are going and we're we're calculating the CPI based on what people are telling, you know, various different government agencies around the world that collect this data. That, and, and a lot of people say that that's suspicious, that we should maintain a constant basket across time. And then I would suggest, well, is that really what you wanna do? Because the 1978 basket, which is sometimes used by people to prove that inflation is actually higher than, than, than is stated, 
Well, it wouldn't have, it wouldn't wait the cost of internet access. It wouldn't co- wait the cost of, of mobile phones. It wouldn't wait the cost of anything. So it's like, are you really saying you want to leave that stuff out and not track that? Because that's what would happen huh. if you use the 1978 standard. And a lot of, and, and, and a lot of people who use, who use this as an argument either don't understand that or they're intentionally misrepresenting that. Okay, so what you're saying is um, the amount of, th- there's like, we've got more optionality of the things we want. Um, you know, when we didn't used to have a mobile phone, you know, we, we could have replaced part of our you know, food purchases with mm. you know, having a mobile phone or internet or holidays. In our, or And our food preferences yeah. have changed. Like, for, you know, I'll give you another example. Like secularly, we know that, that, that sugary sweet sodas have been in a sort of secular decline. Like, I don't know about what it is in the UK, but I know here in the United States, like mm-hmm. Americans are consuming less and less like Coca-Cola and Sprite and, and root beer. And they're increasingly consuming, you know, like flavored sparkling water, right? Like Le, Le Croix. Yeah. And, and, and this is why like Visa, like why, why Coca-Cola and Pepsi have been like really bu- investing in a lot of these brands like to do this. That's a change. Like, so like, like th- that means that the cost of Coca-Cola right? Like to the average consumer is less important. And so when you're calculating the CPI, you you want to take that into account, right? Because people's preferences are changing. They want different things in aggregate. That's going to have negative effects on the economies of scale of those things that are falling under favor. So it might not, like, so it might not even, it might even be expected that they would increase in price given lower economies of scale, just based on secular shifts in in consumer preferences. So calculating inflation is not straightforward. And a lot of people who think that there's an objective measure and the government should just be using that objective measure and not recalculating the basket of goods all the time really don't know what they're talking about. Like this is a really, like, this is a really, really hard problem. Um, and, 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 I, and, and consumer su- survey data is our, really our only way to like get to that, that answer. And it's not perfect. Right, just like no polls are perfect, they don't perfectly measure political, you know, uh, people's political views and stuff. And so these consumer surveys that we do to to calculate the basket of goods that we're measuring against are not perfect either. There's a lot of criticisms of them. Like those criticisms should be heard and responded to and considered. But like that's pretty much the best we can do. But uh, okay, so what what would you say that are the fair measures? Because uh, you know, it's not that I disagree with you, but yeah, I'm certainly living in a world where I'm, yeah, I'm seeing noticeable well, changes to living standards across the board. Well, the three big ones, the three, the three big ones, the, the three big ones Rent, um, are are, are housing, housing, yeah. food, and energy. Yeah, like those, those are the really, really big ones. Those are the ones that are pretty constant across time, and we can look at and we can see like what has happened to those things over the last. You know, there's there's other ones that are important there that are a little further down the list, but pretty still high, like education costs, healthcare costs, um, transportation costs. Transportation obviously highly correlated to energy costs. So, um, but so, so like, if you look at something like uh, housing costs, yeah, and what's the fair measure as a percent of your income, the yeah. average? It, well, it depends what you're measuring. This is like a really interesting one. So, um, you know, there. There is a there, there's two ways you can measure the cost of housing, right? Like one is the prevailing rent, um, you know, uh, in in any given area, which most economists will argue is the only real way that you should tip that you should measure the cost of housing. That like you really shouldn't overly focus on the purchase price of houses. That that's actually the wrong thing to do. Okay. Um, and you'll note it because one of the things you notice is that. Um, and and there's this like thing in 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 real estate. There's the rent to price rent to price ratio, and when and what we've seen over time is the rent price rent to price ratio has been actually increasing over time, which like you know we can kind of get back to the effect of, of zero interest rate policy and and sort of the when when these things go too far, but like the amount of leverage that consumers have had to kind of go out and and take out jumbo mortgages at 1.7% APR has allowed them, has allowed a fixed, relatively fixed supply of housing, particularly in this country, 
which has been very anti-construction um, when it comes to housing, um, is going up against consumers who are operating with more and more leverage. So lo and behold, actual, actual clearing prices for houses are going up and up and up and up. But rents haven't tracked at the same at the same point as price, which actually I think a lot of people might be surprised to hear. In fact, rent to price ratios have been pretty stable across time and have tracked incomes like pretty well. So if everyone was just renting right now, uh, the effect of, of housing costs would be a lot more muted. Not, not that there haven't been real challenges there as a result of the housing shortage, but it would, it's nowhere on the magnitude of price appreciation that we've seen as a result of all that leverage in the market. Um, so like, I, I think, and I think that's like a really, really important like point to, 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 to be here. In fact, we've seen rents coming down in places like New York and San Francisco since COVID, um, but is uh, it, where, whereas prices are still sky high and they haven't really moved much. But isn't the argument there then that people do want to own a house and they mm. want to own a yeah. property and yes, the rents might be stable, but the house prices aren't, and it's mm -hmm. pushing it further and further away from being something people can afford. Mm -hmm. I was chatting to Danny about it earlier. My dad helped me buy my first house. Yeah, it was a hundred thousand pound house. He lent me five, and actually he lent me ten thousand, five thousand for the deposit, and five thousand yeah. to furnish it, and I paid him back. You know, within a couple of years, now I'm looking to help my son buy a house. Mm -hmm. And it's considerably more, yeah. even as a percent of the house, to even yeah. get him close to being able to purchase yeah. something. And by the way, he'll probably get a flat where I got a house. Yeah. And so there is there's a definite, you know, where I live in Bedford, that the house prices over the last two decades really have gone up. And yeah. they don't match the wage rises. Yep. So that's that's they have not. to me. They so have not. They're way me, ahead. In fact, yeah. in fact, it's it's pretty bad. It's pretty bad. It's like I believe like average price appreciation on homes or like over the last like 15, 20 years has been, I mean, depending on the market you're looking at, has been like in the eight to eleven percent per year range. Obviously, wages are not rising eight to eleven percent per year. Obviously, household wealth is not rising at that rate. Um, and, so, can we, and can we put some blame on the fact that, you know, again, back to what me and Danny were talking about earlier today, I said, I've been talking about retirement. It's something that's on my radar now at 45, you know, how long do I want to work for? And one of the ideas would be, well, you know, if Bitcoin did X, I could maybe buy three or four houses. And yes, people would argue keep the money in Bitcoin. But in my head, I get a steady income that comes in every month on the rents. But is it the fact that there's there's been so much cheap capital out there there's a privileged group of people who have been able to do that yeah. buy lots of properties yeah. and that's taken it yep. away from other people yep. yeah like this is this is one of the this this is one of the valid criticisms yeah. that people have of the way that the, the the fiat system has worked for people like this is there's there's serious wealth effects that come out of the way, like zero interest rate policy right um and that's like very real and we should take stock of that but we also have to, but but there, but I do think the, the one of the reasons why I, I sometimes put my my back up against the wall is not because that isn't true, and it's not something that um, we shouldn't like be concerned about in the sense that we've created this sort of like, you know, uh, like th this class of people who've been able to you like basically essentially get access to free money to leverage up their assets and become massively rich. Um, by doing that. Um, but I think we've really, we really burned the candle at both ends here though. We, we can't underplay the role that um, land use policies, particularly and what I mean by land use policies are local zoning policies and ordinances that have precluded the ability for us to expand the housing supply. Um, here in the United States and in other markets. Um, Canada has a bit bad problem with this. Australia has a bad problem with this. London has a bad problem with this. Paris. Um, there's a few like cities around the world that are kind of shining stars that are actually like, pretty good at, 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 at increasing their housing supply. Like Tokyo, surprisingly, as a city of like almost 30 million people, it's actually pretty good at expanding its housing supply as built up as it is. Um, they have really, really efficient um, land use policies there. It's pretty straightforward to get a new building approved as long as it's within code, um, as long as like you tick a whole bunch of different boxes. But, and, and, and they're very like unpolitical in that sense. And, and so it, this, this idea that like, you know, a lot of people make in places like San Francisco or New York, or even here in LA to a lesser extent of like, there's no more room 
It's just nonsense. There's always, for the right amount of money, like I'm gonna sell my house and someone can build a, a 10 story apartment building on it, right? If, if, the, if the local authorities are willing to um, issue the building permit, that will just happen. Because if you have people flooding in, like there's always going to be there's always going to be a, a price that some, that that an existing property owner is willing to sell for, and there's going to be a, a willingness of a developer to take advantage of the demand for housing to actually invest in denser in in, in denser residential construction, and that's going to lead to a more stable housing prices, and and that's just something we don't do much. Like we 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 say things oh like it will cast a shadow or it will alter the character of the city. Um, it's ugly, like um, there'll be too much pedestrian traffic. Um, where's everyone gonna park? Um, like, can the sewage system handle it? Like there's this parade of like reasons why like local officials give for like never approving new housing. And like that is the, like, I, I, I wanna really be clear about this because a lot of Bitcoiners have argued with me and say, no, inflationary monetary policy is the only reason why housing costs are going up. It's like, well, like, but like, no, no, it's not. Like it, like, like housing is a supply and demand problem yeah. and, and demand has been lagging supply for a long time. And by the way, not because developers aren't willing to build, like developers in, at least in this state here, um, can sometimes spend five, six, seven, eight years in court suing local cities to observe their own zoning laws. Right. And, and, and to get ultimately towards this like builder's remedy that we theoretically have here in, in California to allow that to happen. That's a real problem. But I, I want to push back a little bit on that just because like in Australia specifically, I know like housing prices are wild. Um, there's no real like no one there invests in the Australian stock market. Like if, if people are investing in the stock market, they'll tend to like yeah. invest in the American stock market. And then another proxy for that then becomes housing. And I think a lot of it is down to like debasement of money, looking for somewhere to store your money and housing being an easier option or, or a, a, more, a more traditional no, option. No, but, but you got to be careful here. That's true. That's true. But this is where you really need to start thinking about political economy, like as a concept in these markets, right? So yes, one of the real reasons that kind of lurks behind restrictionist housing policies and in particular like Sydney Australia is really bad for this mm -hmm. by the way in fact um, there's a really good book um, by an urban economist named Edward Glazer called Triumph of the City um, and I think he touches a little bit on on Sydney and and some of the problems there um, but like like ho existing homeowners incumbents like have an inbuilt like they, they, they sometimes let it slip. The mask sometimes slips that like, if this happens or you build an apartment building there that casts a shadow on my house, that's gonna affect my home value, right? Boom, like right there. The inbuilt economic incentive is whether I've like fully thought it through or not um, is for incumbents to resist competition because by resisting competition, that means that the, the equity, the marginal value of their home is going up, right? And so they vote for governments that will restrict housing policies. They, they form local community organizations to like protest new development. And at the end of the day, the political economy of it is like, yeah, we're trying to turn our houses into piggy banks. And one of the ways we do that is by protecting it from competition. And, and so that is, in that, that's a political economy problem that we have. Um, and yes, and so, but like the inflation side of it is not blameless here. Like we already mentioned how, given that being the state of affairs, if you have an expansionary monetary policy that supports low rates, and by the way, it's not just low rates, by the way, it's also because we, we subsidize um, uh, default, like homeowners default insurance. And, and at least here in the United States, we have Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac. And it's like the actual, like the actual risk of default is defrayed somewhat by the taxpayer here, which is like actually also a big part of, of the cost of financing. Um, but like, that is like a real, like, that is like one of the, the really the key reasons why housing prices are spiraling out of control. And I think, I, and I think like Bitcoiners have a point to make here around the leverage 
And, and, and also the point you made earlier about people who have access to that leverage, being able to use that to like become richer and richer and richer by going out and taking out like really, really cheap mortgages and buying investment properties and running them out on Airbnb and turning it into like a massive piggy bank. And that's real. That's like the real problem that, that that sort of Cantillon effect is real. And I'm not debating that, but like, that's not the only thing going on. The world is more complex than that. Of course, but this is... This is the world of nuance, which doesn't always <laughs> e- exist, and that, that's fine. And 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 that's why I think it's really important to to hear these counterpoints like you have, because going back to your issue of being sad at the dinner table, there is a lot of groupthink, and it's not to say some of these groupthink ideas aren't right or correct, but I know certainly I'm not smart enough to debate some of the very big issues that people have, yet. I could be sad at a dinner table and somebody's asking me about Bitcoin. I might end up repeating things I've heard from somebody on Twitter or because I don't I don't know the nuance and the detail. And then you can see how that can create a groundswell of people who suddenly all agree on something that might not be true. Mm-hmm. And so getting these counterpoints out or getting people to argue these counterpoints is, is really important. I'll add to that. I'll tell you why I think it's even more important now is that we were when we were Stephen Lubka earlier. We were talking about like Bitcoiners. We're basically a bunch of weirdos. We're kind of like the <laughs> outcasts, or you know, people like I was into punk rock, and Danny didn't want to go to school, and I don't know what kind of outcast you may have been as a kid, but maybe you total were nerd. total nerd. And so we we're all predisposed to being interested in something like Bitcoin. Mm-hmm. Kind of gro- what do you mean what, money the government can't touch? Well, that I can buy weed on the internet with. Like it's we're predisposed to it. But Bitcoin has, Bitcoin has kind of got all of us now. We're in. Mm-hmm. We're done. And if you look at the epochs of Bitcoin, uh, you know, the first epoch was essentially the cypherpunks who wanted this, you know, this money that government couldn't control. And and the next epoch was the tech nerds who wanted to build on it because this technology was cool. And then the macro people came in because they're like, oh, this can change all the macro environment. And we got a bunch of kind of hostile people in that that kind of period as well. And but now we've we've kind of got everyone, you mm-hmm. know, these different subcultures of um, anti-establishment or punk rock people who've predisposed to it. The next stage for Bitcoin is, I say this you know, ca- with caution, is BlackRock. It's, it's that yeah. opening up to the world. Yeah. And when we open up with BlackRock, we open up to everyone. We open up to our moms, our dads, our grannies, in, yeah. you know, the institutions, to our friends. Well, this is... And, th- but sorry, but let me just finish on the point. And therefore, what we do is we make it so commonplace, like everybody suddenly needs it. But if everybody suddenly needs it, I know most of the arguments that some Bitcoiners are making, even if they're right, just communicating that to my friends in a way they can understand is difficult. And also, what if they're wrong? Like I have this huge fear with Bitcoin, this huge fear that a transition to hyper-Bitcoinization, if it does happen or can happen, is awful. The transitory period is terrible. It's disruptive. It's chaotic. Blood, leads to bloodshed. Leads to, you know, I don't know, needing a gun. I don't want a gun. I fucking don't like them in, in the UK. Mm-hmm. But it, it changes things. It's so disruptive that it, it's, you know, leads to poverty. You could have mm-hmm. f- falling um, uh, life expectancy because so much has to die for the transition to happen. And I feel like we can't just say Bitcoin fixes this because yeah. it might break a bunch of shit in, yeah. in the process. So Th- this is, yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I love that. Um, and yeah, I, I do think the next stage of evolution for Bitcoin is um, like what you say. It is it like look like I, I've spent a lot of time almost seemingly arguing against Bitcoin. I'm not. I, I actually am like so pro Bitcoin, and I am so optimistic about how it can fix actually a lot of interesting problems in the world. Um, um, I don't, and I think that particularly like as a global asset, right? Like as, as a global monetary asset that can, I can send Bitcoin to my friend in Nigeria, like right now, and they instantly have it. And it's like, it, it's, it's, it's like a digital bearer asset that has value, that has deep markets, that has liquidity. That's interesting. That's, that's, that's like amazing, right? There's one of the, the biggest problems that, that we see in a lot of these developing markets is they're stuck in like a really, really like, they're stuck in a really bad place. So in Africa, which I've started to, to learn a lot about around these sort of the internal machinations of like money on the continent and how it works, is that 
it's actually really, really, really hard for say uh, a Nigerian bank to get money to a Ghanaian bank, right? And the reasons for this are actually like kind of go back to like really basic trade economics. Like, like why does like why do countries trade each other's currencies? Well, they trade each other's currencies because they're buying and selling stuff from each other, right? The, you know, this, so there's this th these balances of trade that exist between countries, and the United States is special because it's at the center of the the global financial system and and holds the the current global reserve currency, and actually this has somewhat negative effects on the U.S. domestic economy, like contrary to popular belief, um, that I, I know a lot of people will argue that the U.S. dollar dominance has just been really, really great for the living standards of Americans. Um, there are benefits to it, but most of that benefit comes from the, the political power that it gives the United States, which obviously a lot of people in this debate are very upset about and want to bring an expeditious end to. But the downside for the American economy is it means American exports are less competitive because of the fact that there's such a high demand for dollars that in order to maintain that dollar dominance around the world, given the fact that the US does not have trade balance and equilibrium with almost any of its trading partners. In fact, it has a relatively significant trade deficit with the rest of the world. But like, here's the reality. You can't have the world's reserve currency and have balanced trade with the rest of the world. Because one of the products that the rest of the world needs from you is your money. So you're going to have a net negative trade balance with the rest of the world if the US dollar is the world's reserve currency. And one of the, one of the downsides of that is, means dollar is relatively strong vis-a-vis -vis most other currencies in the world. That means that if you wanna build something in the United States using US supply chains and US workers and US factories, that your shit is just going to cost more than building it in, an, in a jurisdiction that has a weaker currency. And this has been one of the main drivers of deindustrialization in the United States that everyone is so mad about. So that is a negative, that is actually a drag on the US domestic economy. Um, you know, some economists have pointed this out, but it is like not popularly understood that there is a trade-off. Now, like you could argue that trade-off has been worth it in some ways, like to the United States in terms of like, you know, it, like, well, depending on what normative values you want to bootstrap before you say this, but like there's been a sacrifice. There's been a sacrifice. Um, now, I don't think that sacrifice is completely wiped out like the, the working class and, and the middle class, as some people would, would argue. Um, you know, I, I didn't finish a thought earlier on this, um, but like the, the reality is, is that like, we, we've done pretty okay, like actually over the last 30 to 40 years. So, you know, I mentioned one of the problems with the WTF uh, happened in 1971 uh, charts. And it suggests that middle class and working class people have lost ground. And that's certainly true in some pockets. But if we look at the living standards here in the United States, what we see is people have access to way more stuff than they had in the 1980. So in 1980, the average middle class family would go out to a sit down restaurant only something like I don't remember what the average is. Like someone's got to check me on this. We'll have to Google it. Maybe like something something on the something on the order of like three to four times a year. I, it was a special occasion in the eighties. Mate, now I'm, you, I'm a child of yeah, the eighties. Yeah. Now we you, we we would do it on a birthday. Yeah. Or we would do it on holiday. Or uh, we used to go, listen yeah. to this. We used to go on holiday, and we would cook and stay in most evenings on holiday. When we go on holiday, I've yeah. never done that with my kids. Yeah, so we see this, we see this. When we look at like how often do middle-class people go on airplanes, travel to far off destinations, stay at hotels, um, eat in restaurants, um, like uh, engage in extracurricular activities, gym memberships, all this stuff. We see that for the bottom two percentiles of society, the bottom quintile, the bottom 25 percentile, and the, 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 in the 50th percentile and below, on all of these measures, people are doing a lot more of all of these things. In fact, and this will surprise people, the lowest quintile, the poorest 25% of Americans have advanced their relative position more than the top three quintiles over that time. Now, 
at least by those measures, not by absolute wealth. We can we we know there's this like wealth gap that's exploding, but when we try to like look for proxies of living standards and like material living standards, like what are people getting? Like how much free time do they have? Is like the other big one. All of these things have improved dramatically in some cases by two to four times since 1980. So I do reject one of the premises. Um, that some people make around this like post Bretton Woods debate that like basically what happened in 1971 is suddenly the middle class just stopped advancing in society. They stopped gaining access to any of the productivity gains that were being delivered through tech. Like that just can't be true, right? Like we we look at we look at all this data and we say it does not appear to be true. Um, the the late economist um, um, who was actually an, an Austrian economist, uh, um, Steve. Uh, why can't I remember his name? Um, oh my God, it's going to come back to me in a minute. I don't want to. I don't. And I don't want to sit here and spin. But it, you know, he he used to make the point that um, people are going to think I made this guy up if I don't Google him and remember his name. Um, but uh, um, he was at Laurentian University. Just Danny uh, will find it. Yeah, but 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 um, but like the uh, the argument Steve he would. Keen. What's that? Steve Key. No, he's been on no, our podcast. No, 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 no. Huh. He's the radical economist. Oh. <laughs> yeah, he's been on our oh, podcast. Oh, I got to look it up now because this is just that people are going to think I'm bullshitting if I don't do this. It's like um, Steve Horowitz. You just had him there. Yeah, yeah, yeah Steve Horowitz. So, so Steve Horowitz used to make this, this, uh, this, this point that the real way you measure inflation is you have to, first of all, like take, take stock of the fact What's funny, he's an Austrian economist, so I don't even really agree with his whole economic view, but I do agree with his point that he makes here, is if you wanna really understand how living standards are changing relative to inflation, you can't use price levels. Price levels are a terrible way to do this. What you need to first do is you need to like actually convert things to time first, since we know that like money is a process to time. Everyone, you know, sometimes Bitcoiners are fond of talking about time preference, so there is some sort of inbuilt understanding for this. But like the biggest, the biggest point that he would make is he's like, look, you work what? Like eight hours a day, 40, 40 hours a week. So you, we work 40 hours a week. How many minutes do you have to work to pay for your daily food intake? How many minutes a day do you have to work to put food on the table for your children? How many minutes a day do you have to work to pay for health care? And what we find is, is when we actually step back and we do that, and we use the average industrial wage as a policy to calculate this, to get to at the 50th percentile, the median, um, we, we see that actually by most measures, cost of living in those terms have fallen, which goes against everybody's like, uh, like for, so for example, I think in 1980, the average worker had to work somewhere on like the order of about an hour and 15 minutes to an hour and 20 minutes a day to pay for the household's food intake. I believe before we started this like inflationary like jump um, that occurred during COVID, we actually had gotten as low as like, I think 23 to 27 minutes of labor hours per day to pay for, for daily food intake. I know that that's actually deteriorated as a result of this inflation spike that we've seen over the last two years, but that is a real decrease in the amount of time that someone has to spend working in order to put food in their mouth. So to argue that food has never been more expensive than it is today, appears to be true if you're looking at these prices notionally, but it's not true if you measure it in the amount of time that someone has to work in order to recover that. So that actually says something about how, like that that there, that wages have at, at some level, have still mar like kept ahead of, of the price level for staples. Um, there are things where things are slightly more expensive. Um, cars are slightly more expensive in, in terms of time. Um, but one of the things that needs to be mentioned there is cars are a lot safer today. They last a lot longer. Um, you know, you commonly get 300, 400,000 miles on a Toyota Camry today. That's not a thing that would happen in a car built in the 1980s. So like you're getting- Well, you just don't see people breaking down yeah, yeah. much anymore. I mean, yeah, you're, you had that as a kid where your car would break down, your but, parents on the side know. of the road. I mean, Do you remember that? Not really. Oh, so <laughs> that used to, it used to be that you probably, you're a similar generation to me, right? I, it used to be a thing. Your car would occasionally break down and then you'd wait I for the I the first AA. car I had broke down all the time. Yeah. Was shit AA, but like, I don't, like, I don't, you don't see people broken down as much anymore. It's a fair point. And so, and so I, I think that, I think that like those measures are, are, 
like you got to be careful with these things. I mean, it, it, because there is some lies, damn lies, and statistics that's kind of going on there. So good that book, by the way. No, that that doesn't that doesn't mean that there aren't some problems there that are being brought to the surface, and the uneven wealth effects are the which you which you brought up before, and and I expanded on are real. That's a real thing. Like that cantillon effect that. Um, that a lot of Bitcoiners talk about. That's that's real. That's simultaneously real, um, and so you could argue. So it's more that like everyone, everyone's quality of life has improved, and the top has improved disproportionately because they've been able to capture a lot of the benefits of pre-inflationary money that can be leveraged to acquire more capital, and that's obviously. What, what we're talking about with the Candlelight effect, and that's real, that's a real thing. That's like, that is the one criticism that Bitcoiners make that I'm like, yes, you're 100% right about that. That is that is a structural problem in the economy. We, we do need to tell Mike who edits this show, don't we? <laughs> yeah, yeah, we do. <laughs> yeah, so uh, Ben Prentice, who created W2EF, Happen 1971.com oh, is man. the editor of this show. <laughs> He's going to be like there furiously going, I'm fucking wrong. Although like he, obviously that website is like presented without comment. And I think he admits that a lot of those charts are quite meme really. Yeah. So what, where, where else? I'm not saying it's, I'm not saying the data is bad. I'm not saying it's, the, I'm not saying the charts are wrong. The charts are real data. I, it, they're not, they're not misrepresented, but I, but I would say that like a lot of people are misinterpreting what they mean. Um, so like this is this is the problem with econometric data is you can re like it like you we see this all the time like like people on the left can can bend economic data to like prove that like unions like improve like uh, improve wages and then like people on the other side like Cato Institute people will present a diff different set of data that appears to show something completely different. Um, there's data that will show that raising the minimum wage decreases employment levels. Um, although minimum wages have ri risen substantially, we're at record low unemployment in the United States. So there's all these like, but then there's like data that you, there's data sets that you can like come up with that appear to paint a different story. And the problem is, is none of this data is lying. It's not lies. It's that like, it's really, really hard to make sense about the relationship between one data point and another data point. So are you saying like with this, because obviously when you look at all these charts, something did change in 1971. Yeah and all these charts do suddenly change. The, Are you basically saying there's also potentially other charts which shows oh, there's a big, po there's there's a big positives? Un, there's a big unstated correlation in that data in the 1970s. One of the biggest things that happened in the 1970s is the oil crisis and the rise of OPEC and the rise uh, and, and, and the way in which, so you have this, if you look at a really important like like a really important chart to like overlay with a lot of that is oil prices. Can we do that? Across time. Um, because one of the things that ends up happening is, is you get the, 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 the oil crisis in the seventies and you had people lining up like, you know, for hours and hours to get gas. And, um, and it was a huge, huge shock to the economy. Um, and by the way, why the fuck do you call it gas? It's not a gas, it's a liquid. We want to call it petrol for you? Yeah. Okay. I mean, no, I just, I mean, I've always wondered that. How the fuck do you call it gas? Um, so, so the oil, the oil crisis really led to the beginning of a new global order for energy, energy production. So as we know, U.S. energy, like energy production started to like peak back then, you know, you had, um, you started, you're starting to see like, um, oil extraction industries in Texas and here in California, including here in Los Angeles. Uh, we forget that the La Brea oil field is here and actually we still pull oil out of the ground just a few miles from here. Um, and the productivity of those fields was falling. The U.S. was increasingly relying on imported fuel. This this led to a massive rise in yeah, so this is this huh. is the oil this is the oil shock, right? Nineteen seventy one. This is uh, this is the oil shock, and so um, holy shit! So from <laughs> so, yeah, so, so from a bottom of nineteen seventy three yeah. of twenty four dollars, by nineteen eighty it had gone up, to, and by nineteen seventy four it's gone up, it's tripled, tripled and yeah. then uh, and then it's two and a half x by the nineteen eighty. Yeah, so this is this is the thing. Like this is the problem with econometric data is you like you see inflation's rising in the nineteen seventies substantially, and you're like, well, okay, well the Bretton Woods 
meeting happens in 1971 and Nixon pulls away from the gold standard. Well, uh, I mean, and then and then what happens like literally like just, just around the same time is we see the rise of OPEC and production cuts and the fact that the US gets a, a fully like, like basically like you have countries that are refusing to export fuel to the United States and we have massive oil shortages here, which sends oil prices through the roof. And th that's not newly printed money, like, chasing oil, like that is just like, people need to get to work and there's no oil, right? And so prices go through the, through the roof. And so like, these are, these are all the confounding variables that like, that I think that people are not careful with. That doesn't mean, that doesn't mean that like, that, like that, um, fiat currency hasn't led to more inflation. It clearly has, in fact, by intentionally. I mean, the Federal Reserve has targeted 2% inflation per year on purpose. Right, like you know, going back to Milton Friedman's like proposed formula, the, you know, the Chicago School monetarist formula of inflation rate targeting, and that has been our policy. So yes, we've had an expansionary monetary policy that is true that has caused price levels to rise on average two percent per year, but like that's not what caused the oil crisis in the seventies. Hmm. So, so if we switch back to your views on Bitcoin, yeah, and like, what does it actually mean to you in your most optimistic world? What do you think Bitcoin means? What's its role? Well, so I've already hinted at the fact that I don't think that, I think that the fiat system has excesses in it. And I think the addition of the digital gold to the world is probably something we need to counterbalance the excesses that we have seen. Like, I, I, I think it's like pretty commonly believed, even, even by fiat economists, that zero interest rate policy probably went too far, um, that like the, the Federal Reserve was way, way too loose um, for way too long, and we're paying for that now. Like even, even, on, even among economists that think Bitcoin is stupid, like there is agreement there. Um, and so when I look at this, I say, look, like, at least as a, as a, as a it, and this is really focusing on like how I view it as a use case as like an American sitting in America. I think there's actually far more interesting use cases around the world, but if we're just gonna start here, I think like having a, uh, an asset which is not correlate, like a monetary asset which is not correlated with the, um, with, with Federal Reserve policy is really important. It provides a potential constraint on interest rate, on, on central bank policy, right? Like, I, cause I do believe that there is maneuverability within, within central bank policy to be looser with money at times when aggregate demand falls and when aggregate demand gets uh, really, really high and labor markets get really, really tight. You gotta be really careful with the velocity of money because that's when you can kind of get into situations where inflation can become really, really elevated and that can become very deleterious to the economy. Now, I think, I think having Bitcoin there is like a really, like as like a major asset is going to have to be something in the future that the Federal Reserve is going to have to consider in the same way that they've had to kind of consider commodities prices and the fact that like, you know, like, you know, precious metal, precious metals, gold, silver, um, at which I think Bitcoin can be much, much bigger than those markets as a, as a monetary asset. Secondarily, I think like the inefficiencies of moving money around the world in places where you have serious imbalances of trade on the African continent, for example, where you like Nigeria and Ghana have very, very little trade with each other and establishing trade requires, you know, like efficient, efficient monetary markets. Well, I mean, they can, they can have as much seven, as much as like 7% slippage between the Nigerian Naira and the, the Ghanaian CD just by the virtue of the fact that they have to like basically go and buy dollars in New York or in London and then sell dollars in New York or in London for like CD, for CD before they're able to get like money literally right across the border from them. Hmm. That's created structural imped impediments to um, expanding trade and creating trade relationships on the continent, which is like really, really bad. And then, then Bitcoin shows up and this is it, it. Bitcoin is starting to create really, really deep liquidity markets everywhere in the world. Like you can, like Bitcoin liquidity from like Naira to Bitcoin is pretty healthy. Bitcoin liquidity from City to uh, uh, Bitcoin is pretty healthy. Same thing in like Argentina. 
Like, and you're starting to see that like Bitcoin is actually a really interesting liquidity bridge between these countries where these markets are really, really deep. And like, it's potentially a better remittance asset than say the dollar. Not because, not because like the, 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 you know, the U S is like intentionally doing anything to these countries. It's just the way that their economies are structured. The trade imbalance is there. Um, they don't have deep, deep liquidity with, with dollars, or they don't have the banking infrastructure to, to deal with that. And then here in, in, in much the same way that, that Africans were able to like s jump, like, you know, uh, leapfrog into the 21st century through smartphones without necessarily having to, 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 to run landlines, everywhere, um, they have an opportunity to maybe fix some of these like, you know, um, financial problems for trade development on the continent by using assets like Bitcoin. And I think Bitcoin has a huge potential there. It's one of the things that we're really focused on at TBD. Like we're looking at um, that Africa and we're saying like, this is, this is amazing. Like we could potentially bridge liquidity between these countries that could provide way, way cheaper basis for trade. Because think about it, Bitcoin has global demand but like city and Naira only have domestic demand. That's a problem when you have a trade balance issue, right? It means it means that like nobody like like nobody in Nigeria wants gone in city. No one wants to hold that, right? So they have to go and sell it for dollars. But not many people in the world like want to do that. And so the the spreads on on that on that trade are really really wide. But when we look at the Bitcoin markets, the Bitcoin markets are like tight. They're pretty, they're, 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 they have actually pretty tight spreads. And so you look at that and you say like, that is like real economic benefit that could be unlocked if we could use this as a way to build like a true, a truly like neutral global remittance asset. And by the way, this, this doesn't have the problems we brought up before around the deflationary nature of the currency, because you don't really care. Like if you're just instantaneously trying to like bridge a trade and like instantaneously buy Bitcoin with Naira and then sell Bitcoin for, for CD or sell it for, like sell it for dollars or sell it anywhere in the world and create some sort of complex trade, like you can just do that. You can insulate your price from the, you can insulate yourself from the price volatility and you can just use Bitcoin as a way to transmit value. It doesn't even really matter that you're getting fi that fiat in on one side and fiat out on the other side. The fact that you're using Bitcoin as the gopher to sort of carry the the, the value across the border and then get access to, the, to get, and take advantage of the fact that it has deep liquidity in these markets and also global liquidity is an amazing unlock. Like this could like create trillions and trillions of dollars. Of, of economic growth in the world. So when, so, you know, when I sort of look at Bitcoin, I'm like, wow, that's amazing. Like this could like literally lift millions of people out of poverty by literally providing the financial infrastructure that is just not there. And, and, and Bitcoin, Bitcoin is to finance in Africa that as smartphones were to landlines there. Like they're able to just sort of like leapfrog some of these problems by taking advantage of this new technology. I think that's super exciting. It's like why I'm super bullish on Bitcoin. And once you start to have a lot of that utility going on, once Bitcoin is like pinning itself down in that way um, with that level of utility, then yeah, the, the, the price of it's just gonna go up and it's gonna become even more attractive as, a, as an inflation hedge, as like a, a non-correlated asset for like institutions to use. And it's going to like place constraints on central banks and their ability to not engage in excess, you know, excess um, in the abstract with like zero interest rate policies that go on for too long because like markets will have deep liquidity to be able to like move into Bitcoin. Central banks will detect that. That will become problems. They have to manage that. So I have a really, I'm really bullish on Bitcoin even though it sounds like I just spent like the very whole beginning of this explaining why Bitcoin's not going to work. I spent the whole beginning of this explaining why hyper-Bitcoinization isn't going to work. I mean, I just, I made a lot of arguments against that, like, you know, like so far. And I believe that. And it's, but I'm, but at the same time, like, I guess you could, I could summarize by saying Bitcoin makes fiat better and it can make fiat better. And it can, and it can, and it can also substantially improve like fiat systems that are far worse than our system and that could do it potentially really quickly. And I'm super excited about that. Do you also think therefore it could end up uh, reducing the number of fiat currencies there are or 
because uh, I think something like you talk about uh, the example in Nigeria with the Naira, mm. but perhaps people don't even want the Naira as their mm. secondary currency. Perhaps they just want the dollar. I've seen yeah. that in so many countries, Cambodia, Argentina, Lebanon, Venezuela, anywhere that's got a shit currency, they just want the dollar. Yeah. So I actually think with the the growth of digital dollars, and yes, some of them are on shitty things like Tron, whatever. People still want them and use them, and they like nobody in Lebanon wants the lira. Yeah. As soon as they get it, they they're trying this to is, get dollar. And so I wonder whether actually the Bitcoin is uh, ironically is going to make the the dollar even stronger as a reserve currency. Yeah, I think there's something to that. Like, well, in another another statistic uh, is in Latin America. Um, about 20% of all savings are in dollars. It may, may even be a little bit higher than that. Um, in countries like Argentina, I think the official figure is like, I think it, I think it's 14-ish percent for like um, that total savings in the country are in dollars. They're not, they're not in Argentinian pesos. Um, some have speculated the actual amount is far higher than that because a lot of Argentinians will literally store cash under their mattresses, like literally, because they don't they trust. Don't, they, because they, they don't trust. It. They don't trust the bank. So the actual savings rate in dollars may actually be somewhat higher than those estimates. But still, one out of every five monetary units um, in uh, uh, of savings on in South America are in dollars. That's that's interesting. Um, that's certainly not the case, like in in the U.S. or um, in 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 some of the, the the big the big currency countries like Canada, Australia, Japan, the U.K. What, what dollars do you hold in savings? I mean, very few. I'm <laughs> pretty much all Bitcoin. Yeah, I uh, think I think I've some got some pounds. Some I think the actual dollars I own are in my pocket here. It's like what twenty? <laughs> oh, you mean U.S. dollars? Like yeah, Aussie dollars. Yeah, no. 20, 120, I've got $125 to my name in yeah. dollars. And in the UK, there's no scenario I'm like, oh, I need to get more dollars because pounds our, are, British pounds are fine. Yeah, they're fine. But like I say, all these countries I go to, they want dollars. They probably, the way, they wouldn't take these off me. Yeah. They're too screwed up now because they want pristine dollars. And they're, cash, they're mainly cash economies because not only do they not trust the local currency, they trust the banks because they fucking stole their money. Yeah. So, I just see this world as you digitize money. Perhaps, you know, you talk about uh, Bitcoin bringing some restraints into central banks. I think a digital dollar alongside Bitcoin brings restraints into the smaller economies. Mm -hmm. And I think that's an interesting, I think that's an interesting area. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, you know, so there's definitely numerous examples of poorly managed. Currencies, um, you know, Zimbabwe is probably the most absurd of all the examples. Mm -hmm. um, the level, like, I, I don't even know how much they've inflated. It's like millions of percent or something absurd at this point. A trillion dollar <laughs> yeah, note. It's it? like it's it's. Uh, um, and so there's definitely so it, there's definitely a problem um, in a lot of countries around the world. Argentina is a great example of this. They're, you know, they have a presidential election coming up. Uh, the leading candidate <laughs> right now, is, yeah, is. Promising to switch uh, to the U.S. dollar away yeah. from the Argentinian peso and get rid of the central bank. Yeah, yeah. Um, well, wow. so I mean, I mean, the problem there is it means it's the classic problem, right? That um, that the U.S. has been like decently careful at avoiding, which is like not allowing the political branches of government to control monetary policy. Um, you know, we could argue like about whether or not the independence of the central bank um, has 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 yielded like ideal results. Like we've already like criticized them for holding rates too low for too long, but the fact that there is a separation of power between money and politicians in the United States is obviously very very important. You know, independent central banks have sort of been the mantra of sort of the monetarist age. Kind of once again going back to to Milton Friedman's influences here. Um, and the countries that have maintained independent central banks have done okay, like relative to countries that have not. 
right? Like uh, another recent example in Turkey, you know, <laughs> Erdogan basically instructing the central bank to keep rates lower. We saw what that ha- what that did. It pushed their inflation rate up to like, what, like over 50% or something. Uh, nearly 100%. I yeah, think. it was like, yeah, absolutely, absolutely insane. So like maintain, like it, to the extent that fiat currencies exist, you really do not want politicians to have a say on, on what happens with rate policy. That has obviously not been the case in Argentina. It is not, was not the case in Zimbabwe. Um, it has not was not the case in Turkey, um, although Erdogan seems to have learned on his feet and realized that that was probably a really bad idea. Um, but like to the extent that you can at least do that, I mean that is a I, I believe a necessary feature to currency stability. I would be very very like the I'm not worried about hyperinflation in the United States today, which will surprise a lot of people. I just don't think it's in the cards right now. But if we saw the Federal Reserve come under the thumb of say a presidential administration and the independence was broken by some populist leader, I would revisit that and I'd probably be a little bit more worried about the potential of hyperinflation. Assuming that things continue operating the way that they are right now, I think like there is going to be more inflation than people are expecting over the next 10 years Mm -hmm. for for both structural reasons, um, uh, trade reasons, uh, and also just the the hangover of what has happened with with debt and and bond markets in this country as a result of 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 um, interest rate policies. Um, but I don't think we're we're in for, say, one hundred percent inflation here in the u s. It's just not in the cards, at least on any short to medium term time horizon that is believable. All righty. So what's your message to Bitcoin? <laughs> <laughs> My message to Bitcoiners is just like, look, you have so many great arguments as to like why we should be working on Bitcoin. Um, and there's so many arguments um, for why we should be teaching more people about Bitcoin, why we should be investing in it, why we should be building technologies around it as we're doing at TBD. Um, and you don't have to be afraid of nuanced discussion. You don't have to be afraid of like, of like, you know, considering the arguments against deflationary currency or inflationary currency. No, there's a, like Bitcoin has a really, really strong narrative, even within a like, I don't like dare to use the word normie construct, right? Like even if you come in with whole normie assumptions about economics and normie assumptions about politics and normie assumptions about, about like the world, I think you can come up with a really, really powerful bull case for, for Bitcoin. And so I don't think you have to go like batshit crazy with like narratives of like the world that are couched in conspiracy and and like outrage and and like insane emotions um to to build a, a compelling case for bitcoin it's just like not necessary there's so many good reasons to believe that this is that this is going to be maybe over time the most important monetary asset in human history i mean i don't know how long it will take to get there um has a long way to go before it uh could could potentially try to claim that title from the dominance of say like the US dollar but like it's not it's possible it's that could happen. Go. it's possible like it's possible it could happen and there's a, and 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 even if that doesn't happen i still think that there's a whole range of possibilities that still uh, that still relate to like a major major strong bull case for bitcoin so you don't have to be crazy you don't have to uh you don't have to be uh bouncing off the wall with conspiracy theories you don't have to um be literally on the verge of burning down the state um to believe that bitcoin has a really really bright future ahead of it and i certainly believe that so i'm gonna like go back to work and and keep working on bitcoin after this even after i just poured a whole bunch of cold water on uh, a lot of the the narratives that I think are are overwrought and not quite correct about the structure of the world. Well, don't read the comments on this one. It's gonna, there are people are going to be really. <laughs> it's going to be it. yeah, they're going to be furious and it'll be savage and for you and I. But look, <laughs> my appeal is to people is that it's the we need the diversity of thought and opinion. Even if you disagree with you, Mike, if these people are listening and disagree with you, cool, sharpen your tools, come back with arguments. Really, you know. Look for the receipts of what Mike said. Um, I think it's really important. If someone wants to call me out and have an open and honest debate with me on any of these points, I'm willing to have it. I'm willing to have it here on your show. Um, Safe, Dean. Like absolutely. Well, if, if he's willing to have a uh, uh, you know a, a, a sort of a 
open and honest debate and, and, and debate in good faith abs. Absolutely. Anyone, anyone who's willing to have a good faith debate with me, I believe that my ideas are challengeable and should be challenged. And I should have good responses to people. And if I don't have a response to a well-formed argument against my views, it's going to make me think about whether or not um, I should be so strident in it. And I think that's how you have to be. And if no one will debate you, then you can just go and debate chat GBT. I'll just keep coming back like, you know, every once in a while on your show and just pissing people off. No, more. man. Listen, like I say, I love it. I, 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 we want, Danny and I want to have the most diverse range of guests the most diverse set of opinions we want to push and pull at this Bitcoin idea over and over and see what we learn. Certainly when I travel, I see a different world from the world that some people talk about on Twitter. I'm like, mm, well, I've been to these countries and I saw something different. So I'm here for it. I love you, man. Appreciate you doing this. Thank you for coming this is on. super fun. Thank and, you. And uh, looking forward to hanging out with you the rest of this week. Absolutely. Yeah, here at Pacific Bitcoin. So yeah, yeah this is my I'm going to be speaking, I think, on Thursday. Am I speaking on, th speaking on Thursday at Pacific Bitcoin? All right, man. We'll All see right. you then. See you then.